appreciated your framing this as a conversation and, and I was thankful for the, the noticings and the comments and the insights that came from you and uh, welcome back if you're watching online. You know, I, I uh, am happy to be back in, in Manitoba. As I mentioned last night, I, I live in Vancouver but on Manitoba Street and I um, just have a sense that um, the people of Manitoba are, are, are amazing and, and, and wonderful. And uh, if you couldn't be here in person because of COVID-19, uh, if next year uh, we're in a more open space relative to the pandemic, would encourage you to come out and, and to meet these um, uh, fantastic people here in Steinbeck and uh, who've come from the region. Last night I mentioned that when I was younger, I enjoyed uh, competitive sports and I, I, even though I'm a very, you know, I'm skinny now, but I was even skinnier in high school. Uh, one of my um, favorite sports was, was football. And so I played a, a receiver position on the team, got hit a lot. And, and, and then one year I decided to try to be on the other end of the, uh, do you, I hope you understand this analogy, the other uh, side, playing on the defensive side, hit rather than be hit. And uh, my, my best friend was the starting quarterback of the team, and he got into a motorcycle accident that was a, a season-ending kind of injury situation. And so I was tapped on the shoulder and asked if I would lead our team as the quarterback. Uh, I needed all the help that I could, could get. And so I actually bought a, a book called Quarterbacking by a former professional named Joe Theismann. And in this book, I remember reading Theismann saying that uh, he was a skinny kid in high school, so I could sort of relate to him. And then when he uh, got to college, he was like the fourth or fifth string quarterback just sitting on the bench. Uh, but he worked hard. He eventually became the starter and then finally turned pro. He actually played in the CFL first and then in the, in the NFL. And uh, he wrote in the book, that if you have some level of athletic uh, ability, some level of talent, and you work really hard, you can turn pro. Uh, but the truth is there are a lot of young men and women, a lot of teenagers and adolescents who have some level of athletic ability, but they're not gonna become a professional football, hockey, baseball, or basketball player. And being a pro football player was certainly not going to be in my future. Uh, I remember um, saying to my uh, younger sister, oh, if only I had your body type, uh, <laughs> I could be like a pro linebacker in the NFL. So, yeah. I, I couldn't say that to a stranger. I could say that to my middle sister. Uh, and she, she, she came back and said, well, if I had your skinny legs, I could be a runway model, you know? <laughs> so touche. Uh, that's not the, the point of the story, but, uh, you know. I don't know how it is with uh, most, a lot of you were raised in, in uh, the Mennonite uh, tr traditions and heritages and so on. I, I don't know if, if this is said uh, in a culture that apparently in some ways uh, feels that, um, you know, humility is the greatest virtue, but you know, if your parents or someone significant in your life told you growing up uh, that you can be anything you want to be as long as you work hard enough, on the one hand, that's a pretty exciting message, and it's important uh, to cite Carol Dweck's uh, expression to have a growth mindset. But no matter how hard we work, most of us will not be running a mile in under three minutes, even if we want to stay warm in the cold of Manitoba. Uh, most of us will not be discovering a cure for cancer. Hopefully those cures will be discovered, but it, probably, it certainly won't be me. Um, and most of us will not be designing a self-sustaining farm on Mars that will actually work you know, there. Now, the message that you can do anything you want to do as long as you work hard is exciting, but if we take that message to heart and, and, and literally, and we don't end up being particularly successful in a worldly sense, we can feel like a failure. 
And, and many young people feel an enormous pressure to achieve. And, and for some of those young people, the, the fear of failure can be paralyzing. And so it almost feels more attractive to do nothing or to do very little. Better to be nonchalant than a tryhard. Better to aim low than to be a failure. I was with a couple of young people at one of our Canadian universities, or studying at one of our Canadian universities, who were part of an elite circle in their school because of their academic achievement and leadership potential. Uh, they were given scholarships with the opportunity to receive mentoring from the president of the university. Uh, I'll call them um, Kristen and, and, and Joshua. And I remember asking Kristen and Joshua, what is your greatest fear? Remember, these are very high achieving uh, young adults. And uh, Kristen uh, said without any hesitation, my greatest fear is that I will not accomplish enough with my life. And, and for um, Joshua, he said, my greatest fear is that I won't be liked and accepted. He was pretty transparent about that. Now, some people feel that the ideal kind of life is one of unlimited possibility where we are free to pursue unlimited achievement. Now, if you're connected in some way to this conference and have some kind of association with Steinbeck Bible College or, or Christianity or, or perhaps vocational ministry, it's not likely that you live with the slogan, he or she who dies with the most toys wins. Probably not, I'm guessing, right? That's probably not you. Uh, and by the quiet laughter, I sense that's the case. But I wonder, and I may be totally off here, if some of you at some level live by a conscious or unconscious slogan, he or she who dies with the most accomplishments wins. I just don't know. Maybe that's the case for some of us here. I, I know that that's sort of a message that runs in the back of my mind. Now, a life of unlimited possibilities and achievements may sound like bliss, but is that really so? In Christopher Marlowe's play, The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus, Faustus longs to possess, quote, all of nature's treasury, to ransack the ocean and search all the corners of the newfound world. And to satisfy his hunger and lust for power, what does he do? Faustus gives his soul to Lucifer, to Satan, in exchange for the services of the junior devil, Mistopheles. When Faustus, when Faustus asks Mistopheles, the junior devil, what is hell? Mistopheles answers, hell hath no limits. Hell hath no limits. While a life without limits may sound like freedom, it may actually be a tortuous abyss of perpetual restlessness and endlessly wondering, have I done enough? Have I done enough? It can be a life of heavy burden and obligation. And a life with limits may sound confining, but it can actually foster our freedom as it supports us in fulfilling our potential and can protect us from unnecessary failure and shame. Greg McCowan, in his book entitled Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, gives an example that perhaps you've heard of, of an elementary school that was built beside a busy road. And during uh, recess and lunch hour, uh, the kids would play on a small patch of the school's property not far from the building, under the supervision of watching adults, teachers, and staff. 
But the school eventually built a fence around the playground and the children were now able to play everywhere and anywhere on the playground and their freedom essentially, in effect, doubled. And so limits can actually foster our freedom. Similarly, a painting or a banner, however large, must finally be bound by some kind of canvas or vinyl or a frame if it's a painting painting or a wall if it's a mural. A playwright or a filmmaker must consider the audience's capacity to sit still and pay attention. A poem is confined to its literary form and a novel must begin and end within the limits of the writer and reader's memory. As the farmer and poet Wendell Berry observes, the arts characteristically impose limits that are artificial. The five acts of a play or the 14 lines of a sonnet. Within these limits, artists achieve elaborations of pattern, of sustaining relationship of parts with one another and the whole that may be astonishingly complex. A truly great life also embraces certain limits. The one human being who, I suppose, as God in human flesh, could have chosen a limitless existence, decides to choose a limited life. So, when the unique Son of God was born, he did not know how to feed himself. The Son of God had to learn how to breastfeed. When he was one years old, the one whom Scripture de describes as the Word learns to say his first word. As a toddler, the one given the name Jesus will stumble and fall and scrape his knee. As, a, as an apprentice carpenter, Jesus will get splinters in his fingers as he's working with wood. And as he's learning to hammer a nail, he will miss the nail and he'll strike his thumb. And I, I, I can't imagine him cursing using his own given name. Probably not. Uh, but he surely cried out in pain. Jesus Christ also limited himself uh, geographically. He never traveled within the relatively small confines of ancient Palestine. And we know from the Gospels that he would grow thirsty and hungry and sleepy and tired. And Jesus chose to limit his life by what he discerned to be the will of his father. One time he was uh, near the pool of Bethsaida and that day he only healed one paralyzed man according to the Gospel of John. There were many by the pool that day, John 5, 2, who were blind and paralyzed but he only restored one person. When later asked about that, why one person, he said, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And so Jesus willingly constrained himself by what he sensed the Father calling him to be and to do. Jesus was compassionate but he wasn't always driven by the obvious need of the moment. When one of his dearest friends, Lazarus, was critically ill, his sisters, also Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, uh, sent him an urgent message saying, the one you love has fallen ill. <laughs> the intent of the message was to make Jesus feel obligated to come quickly. But what does Jesus do when he receives the message? He stays where he is. Some of you are probably preaching on 
uh, John 11, uh, I'm guessing, uh, at Easter. He stays where he is for two more days. And when he finally arrives in Bethany, Mary and Martha come to Jesus and they express their grief and disappointment, feeling if he had only been there four days before, their brother Lazarus would not have died and say as much. And so even though Jesus loved Lazarus, even though he wanted to support Mary and Martha, he was close friends with them, he did not let his affection for them, as hard as it sounds, or even the seemingly urgent circumstances to dictate his agenda, but rather he moved in sync with his father's will and timing. And in due course, as you know, he walks to the tomb and he raises Lazarus from the dead. The greatest human being who's ever lived embraced limits. He chose limits. And in those limitations, he also found liberation as he knew he was doing his father's will. And so you and I can find freedom if we embrace our limits and if we define our limits as being circumscribed by the Father's will for our life. Now, uh, there are certain seasons that can just feel crazy. You know, if you're uh, raising young children, that's, that's a very demanding season. Uh, if you're starting a, a new church, uh, that's also uh, a, 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 tough, a tough time uh, that requires a lot. I've, I've been involved in church planting. If you're bivocational, pastoring, or involved in some kind of vocational ministry, plus working another job or two just to make ends meet, um, you know, that, that, that is, the, the, that, that, that's a lot to, to juggle. But we can also find ourselves, isn't it true, sometimes overwhelmed with life because we have overly porous boundaries <laughs> and we're just saying yes to almost everything. And we can find greater freedom when we realize that we're not being called upon to meet every single need. Uh, do you know the, uh, the, the Quaker elder Parker Palmer? Are you familiar with his work at all? Uh, he's, he has a lot, of, a lot of wisdom, very much. Um, he's a Quaker, but I think there's some uh, overlap between Quakers and Mennonites, so uh, consider him as a brother. Um, in his beautiful book, Let Your Life Speak, he writes these, these wise words. If I try to be or do something noble that has nothing to do with who I am, I may look good to others and to myself for a while, but the fact that I am exceeding my limits will eventually have consequences. I will distort myself, the other, and our relationship and may end up doing more damage than if I had never set out to do this particular good. And then he gives this example, personal example. Over the years, I have met people who have made a very human claim on me by making known their need to be loved. For a long time, my response was instant and reflexive. Born of aughts, I had absorbed. Of course you need to be loved. Everyone does, and I love you. It took me a long time to understand that although everyone needs to be loved, I cannot be the source of that gift to everyone who asks me for it. There are some relations in which I am capable of love and others in which I am not. To pretend otherwise, to put out promissory notes I am unable to honor is to damage my own integrity and that of the person in need all in the name of love. Realizing that we do not need to say yes to every noble or good opportunity can feel like a heavy that load has fallen off of our back. And when we take time to engage in self-care, we can then offer ourselves in service for others. As Parker Palmer puts it, self-care is never a selfish act. It is the stewardship of the only gift we have to offer the world. 
I know this dynamic personally. By nature, I can feel compelled to accomplish as much as possible, not necessarily out of an altruistic desire to serve others, but out of a need to please and impress and shore up my self-esteem and to validate my existence on the planet. And so I find myself uh, restlessly over-functioning and this is driven and accompanied by the shame that comes from the niggling feeling I haven't quite done quite enough. And, and this niggling shame that I haven't done quite enough can come from not having really discerned what God is actually inviting me into and what God is giving me freedom to say no to. And so I find myself praying with the monk Thomas Merton, Free me from laziness that goes about disguised as activity when activity is not required of me. Free me from laziness that goes about disguised as activity when activity is not required of me. And then give me humility in which alone is rest. Give me humility in which alone is rest. And Increasingly, I long to eschew the vainglory and futility of trying to impress others and to live more consciously before the loving eyes of God and to discovering the possibilities and the limits of his good providence for my life. When I was making the transition from the corporate world to the world of vocational Christian ministry, I enrolled in something called the Arrow Leadership Program. Have any of you taken part in Arrow by chance? Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a ministry that helps to cultivate younger emerging uh, Christian leaders, actually based out of uh, uh, Metro Vancouver now, but it's uh, uh, international. And at the end of our graduation, there were about 25 of us in the class, um, the leader of Arrow at the time, Leighton Ford, a Christian leader from Canada, from Ontario, the Toronto area, um, and the brother-in-law to the late Billy Graham stood up and he prayed, this is pretty amazing, for each of the 25 graduates, you know, from, from memory. And I remember him praying over me. Uh, he, he prayed, uh, God, uh, give Ken uh, a ministry in Canada and, and give him a ministry with, with, with young people in Japan. Uh, and at the time, I was uh, finishing up my seminary studies in Boston. I would then head out to start a new church with a friend in Southern California. But then while I was in California, I just sensed this restlessness and this um, feeling that I ought to be back in Canada. And I was mentoring a young lawyer uh, with the um, INS, the Immigration and Natural Services in Southern California, who told me uh, one day, do you know that there are more illegal Canadians in California than Mexicans? So I didn't know that. <laughs> and I was illegal at the time. <laughs> I, I'd just been illegal for a few months. Uh, uh, so I, I, drove up to, um, I drove up to Canada, I lived in a tiny uh, town called White Rock just across the border with a, with a high school buddy of mine. And uh, it's, I don't know how Mennonites feel about sort of mystical experiences, but I didn't know whether I was supposed to go back to the corporate world or to, to pursue some kind of pastoral ministry or something else altogether. So I spent five days fasting and praying. And on day three of the fast, the words 10th Avenue Alliance Church came really clearly to mind. And on day five of the fast, the words senior pastor came really clearly to mind. Uh, and, and then I went to the church uh, and Leighton and Glenda eventually would attend when they were at Regent College. Uh, I walked in and my first thought was, this church is filled with, uh, I didn't say this out loud, but uh, white, white, white senior citizens. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too young, I was 29 at the time. Uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not white enough uh, to pastor this church. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy when I was eventually called because I was single. And, and, but God, God clearly led. Uh, and uh, the church had cycled through 20 pastors in 20 years. Had gone from um, like over 1,000 in its Haiti back in the 50s to like 100 and something. Uh, uh, but when the, the, 
the, the then current pastor left, I, I, I put my name in that, was eventually called under some controversy. And um, I've now been there for more than 25 years, or just over 25 years. And I look back and I also see that God has opened an unexpected door for me to be serving in Japan on an occasional basis, to speak and teach there and to have my writings translated into Japanese. And I, I remember the prayer that God, God um, spoke to me through as Leighton prayed, uh, God, may you give Ken a ministry in Canada and Japan. And I also recognize that because of uh, the limits of my uh, talents and, and gifts and the challenging spiritual terrain of Vancouver that some of you uh, know about and, and Japan, I'll never lead, be leading huge ministries. But as I have a sense that I am in God's will and limited by God's will, there is uh, paradoxically a sense of freedom and liberation in that. And so, so, so that... That is, that, is, that is a gift. Now, we may discover God's providential plan for our life as someone prays over us. Uh, we may discover that plan partly by, um, by the limitations of our talents and gifts. So I, I'm not musical at all. Uh, I, I, I have you know, zero singing talent. Uh, so um, if I've got a headset mic, I always try to make sure it's muted during the singing time. Like last night, I'm sort of fiddling with it a bit. And the, it's, uh, someone noticed the tape issue yesterday. That was my fault as I was taking off my mask yesterday. Uh, the, 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 the headset mic sort of uh, came off. But uh, sometimes I've been singing in church, and someone will turn to me and say, are you trying to sing harmony? When I was, I, I don't even know exactly what harmony is. I sort of have a vague idea. <laughs> Instead of melody, so, so obviously I'm, I'm off tune. So that's one way to, 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 to know about our, our, our limits. Um, the providential prayers of others are limits. Our life stage can also represent a limit. Uh, if we are raising young children, as I mentioned, or if we're caring for aging parents, or if we've lost a relationship, we're going through a health challenge, maybe a financial crisis, needing to juggle two or three jobs just to get by. Those will represent very real uh, limits for us. Um, but we can also discover our limits by seeking to discern what is life-giving for us and what is draining. And I hope that uh, my, I sense, uh, partly based on Jocelyn's comments, that Mennonites, it's not that I, I mean, this is a completely new experience for me, but my sense also is that Mennonites have a strong sense of duty, right? Would that be fair to say? So if that's you or if that's your heritage, listen to what Parker Palmer writes here. Again, this is from um, Let Your Life Speak. One sign that I am violating my own nature in the name of nobility is a condition called burnout. Though usually regarded as the result of giving too much, burnout, in my experience, results from trying to give what I do not possess. The ultimate in giving too little. Burnout is a state of emptiness, to be sure, but it does not result from giving all that I have. It merely reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the, perf from which I was trying to give in the first place. And so just to summarize, Palmer says, Burn burnout doesn't come usually from giving too much, but from giving from that which I do not have, from giving from that which I am not. And, and that is surely a road to burnout. However, giving too much of what we enjoy can also be a road to a kind of burnout as well. So... Um, you know, especially as a younger new pastor, when I would look at my calendar in the morning or at night and, and realize that the following day I would be meeting with people all day long, it caused a sense of uh, excitement in my heart, like I was looking forward to connecting with people. But I also discovered that if I had more than sev seven pastoral care visits in a day, I would feel exhausted. 
And I later learned that therapists and sp spiritual directors uh, typically max out at six or seven a day. I didn't realize that, that those metrics at the time. But even if you're gifted in an area, to give too much can also be a road to burnout. Um, you know, as the trope says, um, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? So, uh, so to be aware of that as we discern, discern our limits. Now, the process of discerning what imparts life and what drains us can also be a process of trial and error. Uh, sometimes we are asked to do something and when we're asked we were feeling intimidated, afraid or depressed and we say no and we later regret saying no. And at other times, uh, we, we say yes right away and, and we realize later we should have said no, you know? So this is a process certainly of, of trial and error. And there are, there are times when we will genuinely feel torn between two options and among the options, there is, there is none that seems to provide uh, immediate uh, satisfaction and solace. Gabor Mate is a Vancouver-based physician and author, and he says, if you face the choice between feeling guilt and resentment, uh, choose guilt every time. If a refusal saddles you with guilt while consent leaves you with resentment in its wake, opt for guilt. Resentment is soul suicide. So that's from uh, one of our doctors, uh, physicians in Vancouver. As we seek to learn how to discern God's will, as we seek to, to learn, I guess it's kind of redundant, I guess, how to decide God's will, um, the Ignatius prayer of examine that Arlene uh, referred to uh, in the last session can, can be helpful. We can, we can ask ourselves and imagine a scenario and ask ourselves as we envision ourselves on this path, do we feel a sense of peace and joy and consolation or do we I imagine and, and then feel a sense of, of disconnection from God, uh, listlessness, anxiety, and grief. So the, the practices of St. Ignatius of Loyola can be really helpful. Um, it can also be helpful uh, to imagine, and I use this a lot in, in conversation with people as a pastor, um, to imagine how we might counsel someone else if they were uh, in a similar situation. And so um, um, I, was, I was asked to give a statement. Uh, I, 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 won't, I don't think I'll put this in the book because it doesn't have to be very specific, but uh, I was actually asked uh, as I was telling Leighton, Glenda, and Cameron yesterday, uh, it seemed innocuous enough by the BC branch of the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, to make a little commercial uh, about why Christians should consider getting vaccinated. Uh, and I, I, uh, um, you know, I was, I was pretty busy at the time. I was about to go on a bit of a summer break, and I said no. But later, I realized how polarizing it is. You know, so I happen to be vaccinated. Uh, I'd be sort of generally in favor. I hope that uh, that's not a huge problem for you. Um, uh, but I also respect people on the other side of, of, you know, who have chosen not to. And so I felt like I dodged something. And if I were to do it again, and if I were counseling one of you, as say a pastor, as to whether to make a statement, at least for Vancouver and maybe the, 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 the region of BC, I probably would say, given how polarizing this issue is right now in the body of Christ, maybe you should take a pass on this, you know? That's probably how I would counsel. And so sometimes when we imagine giving counsel to someone else on an issue, that can bring clarity for us. Ignatius of Loyola also says, when you're faced with a decision, a big, I think particularly a big decision, it sounds sort of intense and heavy, but imagine yourself on your deathbed and you're giving an account before God as to the decision you made, uh, that may help you bring clarity. So you're offered a job, some kind of assignment, some kind of gig, some kind of promotion that will pay you a lot more money, for example, uh, but you realize that you'll hardly ever be able to spend time with your family and your children. Uh, and you, you imagine yourself explaining that before God <laughs> and the regret you feel, that can be a point of clarity too. 
And then, and then, and then one, and then one final thing, and, and maybe at the end we can uh, discuss this further, um, or one penultimate thing. Uh, how we make a decision can sometimes be affected by things such as whether we're asked in the morning or in the late afternoon, depending on our chronotype. Uh, or depending on whether our favorite sports team won or lost. Uh, so uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, professor at Princeton, has shown how um, if you're in prison, uh, like my father projected that I was going to be in one day, uh, and you're up for parole, uh, you're better off talking to the parole officer or the judge of the board just after lunch when, when their stomach is satiated, but not later in the afternoon when it's really hot uh, and, and there's not bad air ventilation because you, you'll probably be denied or the chances jump, you know? And so there's all kind of noise that can um, impact our decision making. So if it's, a, if it's a big decision, we'll want at least several days to discern whether or not to say yes or no. And then obviously, at least in my case, I've made a bunch of errors in decision making uh, in, in my life across the years. Um, you know, like those uh, sisters I demonstrated in that small experiment, uh, let's show the same kindness and compassion and grace and understanding to ourselves when we make a bad decision that we would show to someone else. I think that's, that's really important. When it comes to embracing our limits, it's also helpful to redefine success. So Thomas Merton, this uh, Trappist monk that I keep citing uh, in these uh, presentations, wrote a best-selling memoir called The Seven Story Mountain, and a publisher asked um, um, Thomas Merton to write something, an article entitled The Secret of My Success. And so this is uh, how Merton responded. He refused to write the article, and instead he wrote, if I had a message to my contemporaries, it would surely be this. Be anything you'd like. Be madmen, drunks, and bastards of every shape and form, but at all costs avoid one thing, success. If you have learned only how to be a success, your life has probably been wasted. He's, he's not only a monk, he's a prophet too. Um, if our primary pursuit is success, we will probably forget to live and fail to enjoy life and what matters most. I mentioned a moment ago, um, somewhat extemporaneously, that I was called into this church that had cycled through 20 pastors in, in, in 20 years, had gone from over 1,000 to like 100 and something, and there was a lot of controversy around uh, my being hired because I was young, single, and Japanese. In fact, uh, after one of the first Sundays at church, I was walking uh, to the back of the sanctuary and an older woman approached me uh, of European ancestry and I, uh, there, there weren't many people in the sanctuary so I could introduce myself to a high percentage and I, I shook her hand. I, 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 I reached out my hand to try and shake it and so she sort of pulled back and I said, uh, my name's Ken, I'm the new pastor here. And she looked at me and she said, I, I, I know who you are. I have just one question for you. Why did we have to hire someone who was our enemy during the war? And then I said, you know, no one has ever told me I look German before. <laughs> of course, of course that came to me like way later, you know. <laughs> Wait, I didn't think about then and there. Um, uh, but there was a lot of pressure. Uh, uh, there was some expectation that I'd fail. Someone else came in and said, you know, the reason I think we hired you is because we, we're hoping that you'll be the next Bobby Orr. Do you know that name, some of you? He was a famous hockey player with the Boston Bruins. He's a C Canadian guy. Was he from Saskatchewan or with the prairie somewhere? Um, and the secretary came into my office one day and uh, she said, two or three weeks into my, my um, time at 10th, and she said, Ken, uh, I know there have been a lot of pastors before you, but if the ship sinks now, I want you to know everyone will blame you because you were the last captain at the helm. She was trying to motivate me to work harder. <laughs> I just felt really depressed, you know, and, 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 and down. And um, I wasn't planning to say this, but uh, 
Uh, my mentor, uh, Leighton Ford, happened to be in town, and I was feeling really discouraged. My fiance and I had just broken up. Uh, it, was, it ended up being a good thing, but at the time, it just felt like the worst possible thing. And, and I was just so, uh, just so distraught. And I was too ashamed to ask Leighton Ford for some encouragement. We're sitting in my car. And, uh, and so I instead turned to him and said, can you give me some counsel? That sounds better, right? Then can you, get, can you just give me some encouragement? Can you give me some counsel? He crosses his long legs, pauses, and he says, Ken, remember that God is an artist. He will not lead you to copy anyone else. So seek God for a unique vision for this place. And so those words sank into my heart. I began to seek God in a more intentional way. And once as I was seeking God or over time, I sensed God laying on my heart or I was impressed by the scripture from 1 Samuel 2.35 where God says of Samuel, I will raise up a priest who will do what is in my mind and heart. And I felt that that was true success. I had a little prayer letter that I sent out to folks that I knew and I wrote something like, I don't think God is calling us necessarily to be a large church or a well-known church but a church that does what is in God's mind and heart. And there is something about defining your life success, your true success, is doing what is in God's mind and heart that not only is honoring to God and evokes more contentment and a healthy sense of satisfaction, but it also gives us a sense of freedom and liberation even as we embrace the limits of God's good providence for us those the limits and the, and, and, and the possibilities. When we understand what's most important in terms of God's priorities, it also enables us to protect what matters most. So uh, Clay Christensen uh, is a professor at the Harvard Business School. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And uh, Clay Christensen used to work for the McKinsey Consulting Group and uh, one day, uh, I think it was on a Friday, his colleagues came in and said, Clay, you're going to need to come in on Saturday with the team. We're, we, there's a project and a deadline that we're facing down. And uh, Clay said, um, without apology, but graciously, look, um, Saturday is for my family, so I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't come in. Well, the, um, the colleague left in a huff, kind of irritated and angry, and then sometime later came back and said, Clay, I've got, I've got good news for you. I've talked to every member of the team, and they're all willing to work on Sunday, so you can come and join us Sunday, right? Clay said, uh, uh, years ago, I decided to give Sunday to God, so I can't come in. And, and so, because Clay knew that his priorities were God and his family, it also enabled him to embrace his limits and, and to, say, to say no to certain things. Um, do you have that, the expression uh, in Manitoba, or you've probably heard it, um, go, go big or go home? <laughs> you know, you've probably heard that in the world of sports and other arenas, go big and go home. And we tend to celebrate what's big and, and public and, and seemingly great and widely acclaimed. And yet, God's will which at times can seem small and obscure and seemingly unimportant on a worldly level, really does matter. Uh, Julie Canlis wrote a wonderful uh, thin uh, book called A Theology of the Ordinary. And she points out that when Moses was penning the creation poem in Genesis 1 and began to list off the six days of creation, the people, his audience in ancient Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, uh, would have sat up, was that the word? It would have sat up straight, and they would have started counting in their head, one, two, three, four, five, six. And they would have asked themselves the question, what is built in six days, or in six symbolic time periods in our world? Temples. And so when Moses is describing creation, the creation of the world, in six days or six symbolic time periods to the Egyptians. He is saying that God is creating of the earth a temple. And so no matter what we do, you know, as long as it's not, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, selling drugs like I, I was doing for a little while or something really destructive. We are acting as a priest on the earth and our work is noble and valued by God. Uh, Dave Hattage uh, is, is a guy who grew up uh, in a faith tradition where it was considered uh, most heroic and most noble to be an overseas missionary and then sort of this, this consolation prize was to become a pastor. And so for whatever reason, he didn't feel suited to be an overseas international missionary. So he decided he would become a pastor, ended up earning a doctoral degree in, in some kind of theology, and became a, a staff member at a large church in California, a, a, a large multi-staff church. Uh, but strangely, and much to his surprise, he felt over a period of time that the Holy Spirit was actually inviting him to work as a manager at his parents' family-owned small business in Wisconsin. And he was just stunned. That was the last thing he wanted to do. He didn't want to work in some uh, grimy, uh, oily, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, shop. Uh, he said that um, there was pornography strewn everywhere. Uh, the, the, the workers were so uh, into to, to alcohol and drinking that his own father had set up a beer keg in the lunchroom for the, the employees. And even though there were only 17 uh, worker staff members uh, at the company when he was returning, they were in warring factions with each other. Um, Dave realized that he was in a very, very uh, challenging situation that he didn't want to be in. And, uh, but he also realized that the workplace where people spend most of their waking hours could be the primary place of one's spiritual formation. So, so, so he came to realize that. And Dave rather courageously and transparently began to share his own past struggles with alcoholism and when he did that, when he was vulnerable, some of his own workers started to open up about their own issues. And so Dave was arranged, uh, was able to help them um, um, get funding for, for counseling and to move toward wholeness. And Dave said, over time, I began to, to realize that Jesus was a blue collar worker and that there was a nobility in building gears and pulleys and, and, and sprockets. And so he, has, he began to cast this vision of quality sprockets, gears, and pulleys. And it's taken about 25 years or so, even more. But he says the, the culture, though it's been an excruciatingly and, and painfully slow process, is now starting to reflect more of the trust, integrity, and honor of Jesus Christ. And so no matter what we do, no matter how seemingly mundane our work done on the temple of the earth matters our work may not be particularly glamorous or or widely known um, it may not be uh, very high pay uh, it might involve a hard work raising children staying faithful in a marriage that perhaps is challenging it may involve keeping a home in fairly decent order, but our work done in the temple of the earth is seen by God, and it really does matter. In fact, I was saying the other Sunday that if your work is hidden in some way, according to Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount, God takes special notice of it. And if it cannot be presented publicly, according to the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking sort of euphemistically and sort of obliquely, uh, it needs to be treated with special honor. I have a friend who is neither wealthy nor famous. He has never had a high-paying, glamorous kind of job. He's raised uh, two kids, uh, been faithful in a marriage, He's worked hard, he's loved people well, including welcoming 
Ethiopian and Iranian refugees into his Canadian town. And um, not long ago, on the occasion of his official retirement, a journalist in town wrote this about him. He said, I've met many amazing people in my more than 34 years in journalism. People who have risen to the pinnacle of their chosen fields, award-winning academics, authors, politicians, inventors, business leaders, actors, rock stars, Olympians, professional athletes, adventurers, and humanitarians. But the greatest person I know and have ever met is Ray Matheson, this person I'm describing. You don't have to be wealthy or well-known or to have done something that is widely regarded as heroic to live a truly great life. I'm just starting to get to know some of you, but I would bet, uh, if I were a betting person, that, that many of you are, and I don't mean this uh, in a superficial way, are truly great in the ways that really matter. But in order to live a truly great life, you must live your life. So let me turn again to some of the words of Henry Nouwen. He writes, no two lives are the same. We often compare our lives with those of other people trying to decide whether we are better or worse off. But such comparisons do not help us much. We have to dare to say, this is my life, the life that is given to me, and it is this life that I have to live as well as I can. Led by the Spirit, will you discover your unique path? And as you discover that unique path, you will live a truly beautiful life. And as you embrace your limits and also paradoxically reach for your potential, and the two are connected, you will become your glorious true self, and that is nothing to be ashamed of. Let's pray together. At the end of each of the chapters in this forthcoming book, I'm proposing certain prayer practices, and so I'm going to introduce or reintroduce something called the welcoming prayer here. Um, and I want you to breathe in deeply through your nose, and then exhale slowly. Breathe in deeply, exhale slowly, and remind yourself that you are upheld by a beautiful, mysterious, loving presence. Breathe in deeply, exhale slowly, and remember that you are held in love. As you continue to breathe in deeply and exhale slowly, just pray in your spirit, I consent to the work of the Holy Spirit. I consent to the work of the Holy Spirit. And as you inhale, pray that again, I consent to the work of the Holy Spirit. And as you exhale, say or pray, I let go of my desire for affection and esteem. As you inhale, say, I consent to the work of the Holy Spirit. And now as you exhale, pray, I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for power and control. Inhale, pray, I consent to the work of the Holy Spirit. And as you exhale, pray, I let go of my desire for security and pleasure. And know the freedom of letting go in the presence of a God 
who cherishes you and has your best interest at heart. Amen.